another edition of Hollywood Kitchen. Today, I have a very special guest, and uh, many of you may have seen her perform live. She is an incredible musician and ukulele chanteuse who specializes in naughty and nice tunes from the teens, 20s, and 1930s. And today, she's here to make a recipe and talk about the life and career of Ginger Rogers. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Hollywood Kitchen, the incomparable Janet Klein. Yay, welcome. So excited to be here. <laughs> Me too. And it's so cool that you also, we also both have the same cookbook from 1934 that features the Ginger Rogers recipe. I yes. love this. We just came up, just happened to come up in conversation. I love these vintage cookbooks too, and especially these from the 30s. They're so stylish. And, you know, the photography and everything is just the layouts are, are glamorous. And it took, me, it took me a while when I did get this um, of perusing it that I finally did realize that it's actually an advertisement for the Nord Roller Raider Refrigerator Company. <laughs> Um, that's a stove advertisement book too. So I think that was definitely like a popular way to sneak advertising into the public. So you get inspiration for cooking on your new glamorous appliances that are ever more efficient and modern. And definitely you get the idea that these recipes were geared towards, you know, emulating the stars and their, and their swell habits. And at the more you have these wonderful uh, modern appliances, the more leisure time you'll have, because for instance, you can make things in advance, keep it cool, and then run and go play a quick game of tennis or something, and then come back and have company. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, so, so uh, are you going to announce what recipe we chose out of this? Yes, uh, Janet and I talked about it and we decided to make the peanut parsley sandwiches and the grape mint punch. We thought those would be light, fun, easy to make and perfect for a party. That's right. And brought to us by the glamorous, fabulous Ginger Rogers. Absolutely. And so, and so in order to do this for your show, I just had to steep myself in uh, Ginger Rogers uh research <laughs> which is always complete joy i mean there are certain things that just are like are, are like medicinal good they're always good they're, uh, her films her presence is always this uplifting graceful cheerful fabulous talent and uh, the, the films of the 30s are always my absolute favorite. I'm, I'm kind of stuck on that era. Me too. There's so many parallels also, because I think to a degree, a lot of the films she made, especially the ones with Fred Astaire, they really were such a fantasy escape into this gorgeous, fluffy, gorgeous light art deco world when the Great Depression is raging outside those theater doors. And it felt like I'm sure at the time the world was in total chaos. And I think we're kind of dealing with that now in a pandemic. So once again, these movies provide this beautiful fantasy oasis that you can escape into. And I don't think that is ever going to go out of style. That's right. So all the more relevant today to find cheer in your own kitchen. Yes. Right? <laughs> Fortunately, we all are, are able to get all of our supplies. And this one is so simple. And in fact, I, I was able to, uh, I have some of the ingredients in my yard because this, uh, I have fresh mint and fresh parsley in my, in my garden. And uh, they're both in, they're ready to be put into this beautiful recipe. So, well, which one would you like to do first, the uh, the punch or the um, the sandwich? Let's start with the punch, then we can tipple while we make our sandwiches. Sounds good to me. <laughs> no, and this is a this is a non-alcoholic punch, as per Ginger's recipe. Yes, but I assume you could always add something and improvise if one wanted to. Absolutely, because you know it's 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 safely after prohibition. Definitely. So um, the recipe, by the way, makes enough for 25 people. 
So Janet and I are each reducing our portions relevant to our households. But um, when I post this on my blog, though, I'll post the full pages from the book and the full recipe that uh, serves one back. Wonderful, wonderful. So let let us shall we? Shall, shall we? we? Yes, we shall. All righty. So now we did a little pre preparation, um, and that uh, one of the ingredients they call for is uh, well, the full recipe is for uh, a quart of water, four cups. We reduced ours probably to two cups. And uh, so they ask you to dissolve the sugar in the water and to uh, boil your fresh mint, a whole bunch of French fresh mint in the, in the, put it in a pot and boil it for 12 minutes and then uh, take it off the heat, strain it and use the, use the liquid. You can throw the mint away and maybe keep a little bit of fresh stuff at the end, maybe for a garnish somewhere, but then you strain it and then cool that mint water. So we already pre-boiled our, our, our mint. So we have our mint, minty liquid. Okay. It smells so good. Woo. Okay, our minty liquid. And then what's next? Okay, and then um, let's see, add the strained lemon and orange juice. Yes. Ooh. And orange juice. Okay, add the strained lemon and orange juice. And then the grape juice. Did you do purple grape juice or? I did purple grape juice. Oh, I did white. So we have variety. Cool. Oh, I spilled some. Oops. Okay. So, so I did I did white grape juice. Oh, I might try it with white too at some point and see how the difference comes out. <laughs> Ooh, okay. okay. And then we add our um, carbonated water. Well, okay, so I, I have a, I have a suggestion here. Okay. Okay. Because I did try a batch uh, before our our show, and because I just am here with my husband, and you're there, <laughs> you're there by yourself, and this recipe is made for lots of people, which I love to note that the recipe, in it as stated, is a midnight snack for an after theater party, Ooh. which really made me think. You know, when you, if you are a New Yorker, that's such, that just sounds so perfect that you go to the theater and oh, midnight, everybody takes the cab to somebody's apartment, somebody's swell apartment, and you have a little at home, you know, some little casual, but smart cocktail party or something afterward. Wow, that sounds so great. <laughs> But um, so anyway, here's here's what I found when I when I did this. It's really delicious. So you've mixed all of your your juices and everything. What I what I think is a really great idea if you're not making a bowl of punch to serve right now for twenty people or ten people, is um, is to put it in a bottle. With all the juices without the carbonated water in the bottle and then this you can put in the refrigerator and then you just splash in the soda water into it as you want to drink it and then it won't go south because if you put all the carbonated water in this whole bowl and you don't drink it in the next hour it's gonna die <laughs> and oh, that makes quick right because we talked about that we're not into waste wasting foods so um so i tried it and it's really good because all the juice you just put it in a in a bottle or you have your pitcher and keep that part yeah, i kind of made it in a pitcher and then i'm going to pour it in a martini glass here okay that's perfect <laughs> so anyway let's, let's leave a little room for the for the carbonated water i went and picked up some pellegrino here Ooh. Can I show also what I, I came up with? I took like a little dish, this is a little Japanese, like for making soy sauce. 
and uh, I put in a little bit of lemony water and a little piece of lemon and little chopped up mint and I'm going to put that in the glass and so it's really cute and tastes nice and all that. That's a great idea. And my husband too. And uh, I'm work there on this. Such an easy, delightful recipe. I can't wait till this pandemic is over and I can do these episodes with you and my other friends in person. Yeah. And then I can make a ton of stuff and we can all sit around and eat and have a big vintage dinner party with exactly. these episodes, you know? Exactly. I thought this is this is as close as it gets to having like a nice delightful tea party or something with you. Though. Yeah. So um, all right. So I think we're we're there, right? So yeah, so are you ready to raise a glass to ginger? Oh, one moment. Did you already put in your fizzy water too? Ah, uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Woo. Woo. And I had a little bit of a lemon, a little slice of lemon for a garnish. Excellent. Woo Cheers. <laughs> Woo. Now you have to think of what uh, liquor you'd want to spike this with if you did. Oh, this is really good. Oh my gosh, I may have several of these while we talk. <laughs> no, it's really wonderful. I'm very impressed. Ginger. Yeah. Rogers, thank you. To Ginger. Mm. <laughs> uh, I did hear that Ginger did not smoke or drink, and uh, but that you'd always be able to find uh, ice cream in her freezer. You know, if I can find a Ginger Rogers ice cream recipe, it would be fun to do that one too, because ice cream making in the summer is kind of one of my little hobbies. Do you have a machine? Well, when I was a little girl, uh, Grandpa Bible used to have the hand cranked rock salt thing in the garage. And he would make me, when I visit him every summer, the best tasting fresh blackberry ice cream on oh. the planet. And as an adult, I kind of started thinking back about those days and I thought, I'm going to try to recreate that. But I used to have a rock salt one myself, but my kitchen's really small and it made a huge mess. So one year for my birthday, my parents upgraded me to a Cuisinart. But I love getting creative and I've made all sorts of different ice creams for different friends. Um, one summer I drained, I soaked fresh cherries in rum for like 24 hours, drained it off and made rum and chocolate ice cream. Do I have a question? I and when you put rum in, in your in your potion to make ice cream, does that make it take longer to freeze? Um, it really didn't though, because I drained it out of all the cherries. I poured it through a, a sieve and like drained it all off, but the cherries kind of retained the flavor, you know? And oh, then that I good. made a vegan ginger citrus ice cream for a friend, but it's really fun to kind of get creative and make all sorts of flavors. You can experiment with nuts and fruits and alcohol and all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of one of my summer hobbies. <laughs> Any of my friends that have kids, I try to, like last summer, especially with the pandemic, I made a bunch of ice cream for friends with kids because it's something that makes people happy. And so I really, let's find a ginger ice cream recipe because that needs to happen. All right. Now that sounds amazing. I mean, I am, um, we, we live in Alhambra in an old house from 1908. And, you know, the thing about immersing yourself in the culture you know, going back in time, these old recipes, it's really is, it really is kind of an immersion therapy, you know, and you discover why your grandma made certain dishes and, and we have um, wonderful soil here. And so we have a garden, uh, we for it, we have a lot of things that we grow. We have grapevine and um, so we get grapes, we dry the raisins. And I cook with the, and also a fig tree. So I cook with the figs and raisins. I just made, um, I just made, I had to show you because I can't give you any right now. I to, but I, just, I make fig and raisin, like a filling with uh, dried orange peel. And uh, oh, it's so good. And I, I make cookies with this, with the winter time. And there's just so many things that uh, are pleasurable and uh and you know feel like home and we can make other you know share it the garden always gives you too much and it makes you you have to share it 
which is nice. I live in a 1920s uh, garden court apartment. It's shaped like a big U, you know, with a little garden area. And um, I guess that's a very LA kind of thing. But a lot of times, while I don't have like lemon or avocado trees, neighbors down the street do. So every few days at, the, at our mailboxes, there'll be a giant brown bag filled with avocados or lemons or something that somebody in our neighborhood just sets it out and you just walk by and take one. And that's kind of a thing. So that's I love California that. Dream. You know? That's the California dream. It is. Well, which was it? Uh, the Charlie Chaplin movie? Was it Modern Times where his whole fantasy has a fantasy with a, a oh, uh, Paulette, Paulette Godard, right? And uh, yeah. They have a fantasy about having a home together. And, and part of the fantasy is that you can retread right at your window and pick an orange off the tree. You know, that's that's a good dream. And yes. We've got, the, we've got the climate for it and everything. So, uh, well, so do you want to try uh, making the sandwiches? Probably? Yeah, let's make the sandwich. All right, now part two, we are going to make uh, Ginger Rogers peanut and parsley sandwiches. Yeah. Yes. So what we'll need is uh, we'll need one and a half packages of cream cheese. And again, this is if you're making it for a large group. Well, how many, actually, I take it back, how many did it say in the recipe, Janet, that it feeds? You know, I separated myself from the book. I can go look. But yes. I think that I, I prepared a, a half a recipe, too. See, it doesn't say it, I think. I think you can just do it as, yeah. So here's the thing that um, it, this is something that you can prepare and, uh, and then refrigerate the rest if you don't, if you, you know, aren't ready to make sandwiches for a party right now. <laughs> so yeah, I did a, I did a half recipe proportion also. So instead of the traditional uh, package of cream cheese is eight ounces. And she suggests that you set it out to soften it. But these days we have whipped cream cheese, right? So that makes it easy. What did you, do you have that? Uh, I had I brought the package of cream cheese, but I it's been softening outside for a while here out of the refrigerator. So. Okay, so uh, is it just we just oh uh, we start with um, the nuts and parsley. Okay, um, Lind will finely chop salted peanuts with finely chopped parsley. Yay. So I did a quarter cup, half a red <laughs> chopped peanuts, salted, roasted. You know, I was gonna say I um I didn't know if I could chop my uh, the peanuts and how well that would go, so I put a bunch of them in the blender. I was shocked at how well my blender handled. This is basically a bowl of peanut dust. Basically, it's it's amazing. <laughs> you can sprinkle it over something else. Maybe that would probably be very good. Yes. And, and so I put it on the blender for a half a minute more. It would probably be peanut butter. So I'm putting yes. into my bowl the chopped, finely chopped peanuts. And finally chopped parsley. Parsley. Okay, so I'm mixing these two the peanuts, peanuts parsley and sandwich. sandwich. Okay. It sounds like those Depression era sandwiches that people would do. Oh, yeah. And our cookbooks are from 1934. So that would have been right in the middle of the Depression. Yes. Okay. Um, add cream cheese mixed well. Cream cheese. So I'll tell you uh, a secret. I did. I did make this. I, I did make try making this the other day just to try it out ahead of time. And what I realized about this recipe is that it really reminds me of the little uh, tea sandwiches that that you have at ladies' parties. So it's very. Uh, it's a very delicate sandwich filling. And so the first time I made it, I made it with crusts on the bread, but I thought, oh, you know what? This seems like it would just be so nice to do it with bread that where you cut all the crust off. Oh, I didn't cut the crust off mine. I should do that right and now. Of course, it's a personal preference. Okay. But, uh, but it was just what I felt after I tried it out. Once. Okay, I'll, I'll cut my crust off right now. Another thing that seems 
interestingly, something that I would naturally do is that a lot of old fashioned sandwiches, I think that they would butter the bread no matter what they were putting on. Even like English sandwiches, that you could have a meat sandwich and they would still butter the bread. <laughs> so, first of all, it's always a matter of personal taste, of course, too, that we modify if necessary. Okay, so I've buttered my bread here. <laughs> oh, so buttering the bread. And uh, my husband is, is a premier toast maker. And I mean, this kind of toast, bread and butter toast. And um, he's very particular about that idea. If you have butter that's too cold, when you go to butter your bread, it's going to be hard to spread onto your bread and then you might mutilate the bread, you see? <laughs> so either this kind of thing where we're not toasting, you just uh, leave the butter out a bit so that it's, it's very nice and spreadable. But his thing is that when he makes toast, he toasts it first so it's hot. And then you can take butter right out of the refrigerator that's cold, but you just put the pads, let them sit on the hot toast and then it gets soft and then you spread it so you don't force okay. it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we've got we've got our mixture. Now we just scrub the mixture on the sandwich. And then we're doing our we're doing this in the kitchen after dark. So this is almost like our uh, midnight snack after theater party. I love it. <laughs> Except that we're doing it and then we're going to talk theater entertainment after we make the sandwich, right? Yes. Absolutely. Woo. How's it going? Good, good. Here's our, here's what mine looks like right now. Woo, cute. Okay, I did it too. Wait, I spread it and now I'm going to close it. I'm going to add a little bit more of the peanut mixture on the top, just the crumpled peanuts, because I have a lot of them. That sounds nice. See, I'm going to cut it like little finger sandwiches. Yeah, we'll do that too. And, and then when we start talking about ginger, I'll ask you a question and then I'll just sit here and eat while you tell me. Okay. <laughs> Woo. And I have extra from the garden. Nice. So a little mint and parsley on the plate, right? Oh, Perfect. The therapy. <laughs> All right. So how's yours? Are we there? Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm here. I think I've got the final product right here. Oh, that looks nice. I have to go get some garnish for mine later. <laughs> wow. All right. No, seriously, I think this was really, uh, this is like a little treat. All right, so I think I'm going to take a bite out of mine too. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Mmm. Okay. It's like a very light and ladylike, almost a peanut sandwich. Mmm. I mean, almost like a peanut butter sandwich, but more delicate. You know, I'm going to chalk both of these up as winners in terms of how they've turned out. I'm starting to trust Ginger more and more. Perhaps we should revisit in future episodes and just make everything Ginger says to me because we're having good luck here. I'm sure you'll, you'll find out who, who really was a good cook and who was just, you know, a, a celebrity that they were, you know, maybe somebody else concocted a recipe in their name. Or, um, uh, or like um, your Marlene Dietrich uh, potato salad recipe sounded very much like she she was a cook. She knew how to cook and real home style. Definitely, Joan Crawford, Vincent Price were both cooks. But it's funny in some of my old vintage cookbooks, literally Clara Beau and Kay Francis admit in the pages they don't cook at all, but they sure enjoy eating the side of. And I'm like, those are the only two I've ever seen that were very upfront about it. <laughs> I, I have a, um, I have a 1930s cookbook of Beverly Hills 
women's club. And they had uh, Will Rogers wrote the foreword for it, an amusing foreword about the, the, you know, the recipients of these uh, new recipes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, I remember there was a distinctively odd recipe by Carol Lombard for a cream of lettuce soup. I <laughs> say that, <laughs> but, you know, that just doesn't sound so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's that, a, one I was just reading the other day from John Crawford, and it's like, take a plate of spinach, cover in bacon grease, sprinkle bacon bits on top. And I'm like, how is that a really a salad? I mean, I don't think that counts as a salad if it's mostly bacon. I'm kind of, it's basically like bacon grease, bacon, with lettuce. Huh? bacon grease in a salad yeah it's like spinach um, salad leaves covered in bacon grease with bacon crumbles and i'm like mm, i don't know John. <laughs> <laughs> i love her but that one raises my eyebrows a little bit i i have my doubts about, about going for dinner at joan crawford's house i don't know <laughs> oh, man. anyway we don't have that opportunity so so let's do our deep dive into gender because I think more than the average person, you can really provide a lot of insight into gender's early career, especially because vaudeville is something that you know very well. And that was Ginger's training ground and start in show business. So tell us about her early days as a performer. Yeah, well, my, my personal uh, preference for all of my focus um, on music and culture and everything else is uh, pretty much like 19 aughts through about 1938. That's, that's sort of my cutoff where once you get to 38, the world is going to hell in a handbasket and, uh, and the music gets very, it's very much like now, it's very modern. And even Gershwin is writing songs about the yams or something, just it gets so silly. And uh, maybe that's, that was another coping me mechanism or the sense of cool factor kind of came into the culture fast and furious, which I feel lasted and just kept going. But I just feel like all this earlier culture is a little, it's just less tapped. And, um, and, uh, and I just find it never ending thrilling to, <laughs> to investigate because you can start with, you know, theater and it takes you into uh, vaudeville and, you know, nightclub scene and early, early uh, silent films, early sound experimental films. And, and you just figure that in this going back in time, the early part of the 20th century, there were so many venues you know, even during the depression, I think that musicians were doing pretty well because they were, there were so many jobs. You could, you needed live musicians in the movie theaters to play for the silent movies. And that, you know, um, <clears throat> and every theater had a pit band, the restaurants had live music, the hotels had live music. Um, you know, any event had live, live musicians. And uh, so there was just a lot of work. And I think, you know, I just read a wonderful book by a lady named Jeannie Poole. And it's about um, Peggy Gilbert, who had a band. Um, uh, I'm going to mix it up with Babe Egan and her Hollywood Redheads. But that was, I think, Peggy Gilbert had different, different names for her bands. But she had an all-girl band. That's, that was her thing. And in the 20s, I think that um, there was a lot of work for girl musicians. And similarly, in early film, in early filmmaking, there was a lot of work for women. There were big time women uh, film directors and women like Mary Pickford, absolutely great businesswoman. Now, okay, so, so to relate it back to Ginger, uh, Ginger was born Virginia Catherine McMath. 1911. Her uh, her mother, uh, she, she was born in Independence, Missouri. Her mother was Leela. Would you say Leela? I think so, yeah. Leela, Leela Emogene. <clears throat> she married a fellow named William Eddins McMath, who was an electrical engineer. 
And Ginger's mother uh, played a huge role in her life going till the end of uh, Leela's life. Uh, Leela was a force to be reckoned with herself. And she was one of the first 10 women to be accepted into the Marine Corps. That's she amazing. went, uh, as Ginger said, she was, she wrote scenarios for early films. She was a newspaper woman. And uh, so she was uh, very interested in, in theater and in movies and was involved very early. So, um, so in uh, Independence, Missouri, uh, she was married to Mr. McMath. Um, Leela lost her first child and um, <clears throat> Leela was Christian science. And when they went to deliver her first child, uh, they used a forceps and she lost the child and it caused a lot of stress with her relationship with her husband. And probably when Ginger, you know, when she was pregnant with Ginger, she was probably hardcore <laughs> going with her, her religious views. And um, so anyway, they split up very early and, and she really had no relationship with her father going forward. Her father tried to kidnap her at one year old when she and when he and Leela were having marital problems. Um, but then she was returned to her mother and then she said she never saw her um, natural father again. Um, so uh, Ginger did not have any other siblings and apparently her name, Ginger, because her real name was Virginia, um, she was called Ginger partly because she had cousins who couldn't properly pronounce her name. <laughs> and so the closest they could come up with was for Virginia was Ginger. <laughs> so they said it was very apropos anyway because she had kind of um, reddish hair. So, uh, so uh, let's see. So she, uh, she also, um, I listened um, in preparation for today to some interviews with Ginger Rogers. And um, she remarked that her mother also wrote scenarios for vaudeville performers. So she, there were, you know, performers around her mom. And she said that her mother wrote scenarios for uh, a lot of child acts. Uh, there was, um, let's see, one called the Lee Kids and Baby Marie Osborne. And she did these things for vaudeville and also for the three reelers. And um, so anyway, she said that when she was nine, uh, she and her mother moved to Texas and her mother remarried uh, Mr. Rogers. And it was his name. Um, John, I think his name was John Logan Rogers. So they went to live in Texas. And so Ginger uh, had a lot of personality. She ended up at the age of 12 winning a Charleston dance contest. And so that, that kind of set things in motion. Like her mother realized she had a lot of talent. She was already doing uh, scenarios for other kid acts. So uh, it was said in one of the things I read that Ginger thought about being a school teacher, but her mother um, urged her to try to go further with entertainment. And um, so, uh, anyway, so she apparently became part of uh, Eddie Foy of the Foy family, and uh, part of his vaudeville troupe at one time. And so I think there was a period where, um, you know, they were living in Texas, and then the mother uh, went uh, ahead to uh, uh, live in Hollywood for a while. And I think that was maybe before she remarried. Uh, so the mom went uh, to Hollywood and Ginger stayed with relatives for a bit. And uh, anyway, so they were living in Texas. She won that award. Well, by the age of 17, she uh, got married and she married a vaudeville performer. Uh, his, uh, his name was Edward Culpepper. And he went, his stage name was Jack Pepper. And they apparently had an act together called Ginger and Pepper. And I have not been able to find any photographs of the two of them together. I'm very curious. And I did read something where um, in, there's an MGM film uh, that I've never seen called Barrier. 
and um, it's with uh, Lionel Barrymore. And apparently, Ginger does a version of her old vaudeville act in this film. Oh wow! I need to track that down. So I, would, I would love that. I just I just read that snippet and I looked around to see if I could find uh, the movie, and I, I could not find it. So. Um, but that may be the last trace we have of what the heck was their vaudeville act. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But obviously she was uh, a singer and a dancer. And um, I don't think that she got a lot of formal training. You know, she dropped out of high school and, and I think that she was kind of a, just a natural and uh, sort of made her way with uh, chutzpah and, and and a little hotsy totsy personality. <laughs> and so let's see. Um, apparently, she had another act called Ginger and Her Redheads, which was a, a trio of some sort. And um, so she, um, after she split up the marriage with uh, Mr. Pepper, it didn't last too long. She did admit that she did. Her mother told her not to get married like that. She's too young and she did it anyway. And then she did admit that it wasn't the best choice. So she ended up, the next thing, uh, she went to New York. And so that's when she was involved with this uh, trio and she was in several New York stage shows. And um, so this is like 1929. She was in Girl Crazy. Uh, which I believe was a, yeah, it was the, um, George and Ira Gershwin wrote all the music for it. Um, and uh, she was in another uh, show in 1929 called Top Speed. And uh, the girl, when she was in Girl Crazy, that's where she first met Fred Astaire. And uh, his real name was Fred Austerlitz. And he was from Omaha, Nebraska. His father was uh, a brewer. So not exactly, you know, I mean, you know, the things that they write about in fancy PR where they make you sound so elegant and highbrow and from the finest. <laughs> so you're both just regular kids, you know. And um, so apparently working on Girl Crazy, they said that uh, Fred Astaire wasn't credited in any way, but that he did as a, as a helper out or thing when he met Ginger. Um, he helped her with some of her dance uh, routines in that show. And apparently they did date a little bit. So that was maybe when they actually did have a little bit of uh, romantic something or other, but uh, it didn't, ultimately everyone wants Fred and Ginger to be a couple. <laughs> and I think it, it comes through their affection for each other. And, and honestly, the, uh, throughout their careers, people were always coming up with with uh, stories and maybe scandals and arguments and competition and things. And really, you know, when you hear both of them, I think that they just really mutually respected each other uh, so much. They worked, the two of them were a couple of the hardest working performers, absolutely without a doubt. I mean, there were stories of them uh, working so hard that, you know, she's bleeding through her shoes and, and Fred Astaire was, they called, he had a nickname, Moaning Minnie, because he worried so much and he worked so hard. He was just a perfectionist. And so he made all of his partners throughout the whole, their whole career, uh, his career, any partner would have to work really hard to, to, to work with him. And, and she, Ginger also. Ginger kept up for sure. And Ginger also was off doing a lot of other films. So from what i've um, heard hermes pan would work out the choreographer would work out the routines with fred and then ginger would just kind of come in later in the process and she'd have to very quickly pick up these incredibly complicated routines and match fred absolutely right and uh, apparently uh, hermes pan did a lot of the tapping sound track for their films they said you probably are hearing hermes pan's uh steps the sounds of the steps, but she definitely danced her heart out and, and, and totally kept up with him. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like she, she says, I think ultimately uh, people for, you know, just lightly mention, 
all the Fred Astaire movies and sometimes they don't say Fred and Ginger. I think she was very hurt by that because she felt that they were a, a real team. And uh, I did hear that um, the, the, um, the thing that was so aptly said about them, I, I believe it might've been Marlene Dietrich who said that their chemistry was that Fred gave Ginger class and that Ginger gave him sexual aura. <laughs> I think Catherine Hepburn was the one that that was the term. Was Catherine Hepburn? Yeah, but they they were so great together. And what, I, what always strikes me when I watch their films, they make it look so effortless. Yes. And that every time astounds me that it just looks like they're floating on air. And this is just, they just get up on the floor from this nightclub and just naturally and inherently know how to dance like this. And one, one of the things about the routines was that they were very naturalistic in a way, that they they had, they were loose, they were sassy and graceful, and they looked like they, he, he would often do things where, you know, they were so in sync, but he looked like he was sort of suggesting through the dance for her to do something and she would follow and she said that was probably why people thought that he was her Svengali because some of those the vibe of those dance routines were almost like he was hypnotically you know making her do something <laughs> to follow him without even the slightest of uh, touching you know she was just there oh so exquisite they were just just uh, a total delight and I find that a lot of younger people that I meet when I perform uh, my band, uh, it's called Janet Klein and your parlor boys. And when we play this old music, often I'll have younger people come up to me and say, what is this music? And usually I would just sort of on the easy thing say, oh, you know, those black and white movies, like the Fred and Ginger movies, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you know, you'll hear all these songs used in those movies. And, um, and I've had people say to me, but who are Fred and Ginger? People in their you know, 30s, it's a, people are missing out if they don't. Boy, are they. I, I know, one fellow came up to me and um, gave me his card and it had something to do about, he was a radical optimist. That was his title on his card. And I said, and you do not know about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers? Wow, they are the epitome of radical optimism. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think some younger people, they just need a gateway drug. Like uh, Mary Mallory and I co-wrote this book, Hollywood Celebrates the Holidays. And it's, you know, movie stars at Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, et cetera. I was doing a book signing one night at our mutual friend Nicole's uh, shop, Paper Moon. And these teenage girls came up to me and they looked at my book and they kind of rolled their eyes. And my first reaction was to just get all angry, but I didn't. <laughs> and they kind of seemed like, ugh. And I go, hey, what is it you guys are looking for? Just out of curiosity. And they go, we want tough women that are sexy and smart and pretty. Wow. I go, well, you come here and let me tell you a little something about a woman named Reed Hayworth, a woman named Ava Gardner. And I kind of told them a little, and then I showed them some pictures and they were actually pretty receptive. And I said, look, you guys get together some night, obviously before the pandemic, I go get a pizza or sushi or whatever you want. <laughs> And you promise me, I'm going to give you a list of five movies. You promise me you're going to watch one or two of these movies, get your girlfriends over, make a night of it. And I guarantee you, you're going to see things in a different way. Just open your mind and a world of opportunity and magic is just so amazing. I mean, one of the things that, that uh, I, I notice <clears throat> is that when you look at some of the earliest movies, you know, look at, look at Wings or... You know, there were um, a lot of portrayals of women being pilots or, or just jumping into the scheme of things and, and, and having lots of experiences and gusto. And it was, you know, the, the thing about, about feminism is it still is worthwhile to go back because there were always cycles. There were, uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that and I realized, you know, going back in time is that when you study uh, about the, the suffragettes, the ladies that were uh, working for women's rights, um, that were uh, 
fighting to get uh, Planned Parenthood and um, contraception to be something that was in the public zeitgeist. Um, they, it was it was to allow women to have more control over their own lives, and uh, and when you look at the ladies from the teens, you know they fought hard. Those ladies, uh, a lot of them, you know, I always wonder about you know women got the right to vote in 1920. That's the same year that temperance became a law. So I thought, oh my gosh, all the the women haters or questioners of how many how much rights should women have the first thing that happens is we get temperance <laughs> we were lucky that they didn't put the the right to vote back in the bag <laughs> so but that wasn't necessarily just women who voted for temperance but that happened um but the thing is that uh i think that all the things that those ladies fought for by the 20s and and the kind of 20s, roaring 20s revolution, you know, post-World War I, people have sort of had it with all that seriousness. Women did get a lot of new rights. The clothing changed so drastically. Women were able to get rid of wearing corsets and bustles. I mean, when you look at the change, it was so drastic from Victorian era uh, for women to the 1920s is just jaw dropping. They cut their hair, they stop wearing these gigantic hats and, you know, incredible, uh, 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 oppressive uh, things that they had to deal with just as that was just the way things were. And uh, so if you're gonna be a strong woman, you had to deal with all of the trappings and, and so, of the social norms of the day. Um, so a lot of those women were extra strong because they had to fight to be accepted into, you know, a medical school or law school. Women at that time, they did, but man, few in numbers because they had to, they had to break those barriers. So you can't just look back at everything um, black and white, <laughs> the old movies, and think that it's, you know, all cheesecake. History is so complicated and so nuanced, and there's so much context, there's so many layers, there's so much to discover, and it's it's truly endless. Yes, and it's just, it's uh, enriching to know, to know that, not just to turn it all away just because there's certain things that don't appeal to you, because there's, there's a big, there's a lot of payoff there, and then just a knowledge about where you come from, what your culture is, what your grandparents' life was like. And um, anyway, I just never get enough of it, that's for sure. <laughs> Should we go back to Ginger? Oh, yes, yes. That's that's more. Um, so uh, one of the interviews that I saw was, um, uh, was a sit down with Ginger Rogers and Ruby Keeler. And in the course of the interview, it came up that they had both uh, been auditioning for a, a, a Ziegfeld show called Showgirl. And um, Ruby got the part, but, uh, but Ginger said, you know, I, I auditioned for that myself and I wanted that part, <laughs> I lost it. So um, anyway, so that was kind of like the tail end 1929 of um, Ginger Rogers in New York and being in some of those theatrical shows. And the next thing was she came out to Hollywood and it didn't take her long to get a contract uh, with Paramount. And so obviously she, she just, she had just enough connections maybe through her mom and talent to wiggle in there and uh, right off the bat got both you know, very musical parts, um, singing and, and things like that. She was in a movie with Joey Brown. <laughs> I love her when she sings Pig Latin of We're in the Money. Oh, because uh, and she just pops on the screen. Like, I, I kind of think a lot of stars, even early in their careers, when you see them, you see them pop very early on. Absolutely. Like, that star power is so evident so early. There's a, there's a fun story. So, so the thing is that um, really for Ginger Rogers, 1933 was her complete bust out year. There was 42nd Street and the gold diggers of 
Broadway, 1933. And so she said in that Gold Diggers of 1933, she said that that scene where she sings, we're in the money in pig Latin. Well, that came about just because she was goofing off backstage and Selznick came through. This was a, a, a yeah, that was Warner Brothers. And uh, so he can't, he was just backstage and he saw her doing that. He said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just, I'm singing my song. I'm playing around. So she went out and she did it the way she thought she was supposed to do it. And he came out, well, what happened? You were not doing it the same. You're not doing what you were doing backstage. And she said, oh, well, that was, I, I was just making that up. And so she's singing, we're in the money, your way in way of the money. And uh, so he, he said, no, you do it. That was great. And so that was just her and her just spark of fun. <laughs> and of course, flying down to Rio was the first time she was paired on screen with Fred. And they, they were only, they only had one number in the movie, their supporting players. But once again, I mean, the minute they danced together, it was obvious to everyone. This is yes. This is magic. You know yeah. that that was uh, that was interesting. I just went back and watched it because I I feel in a way all of these uh, the Stere Rogers movies uh, the scenarios I get them confused a little bit. It's like Marx Brothers movies. They're so delightful. I could watch them a million times over, but the stories are so light it's like which one was that what were they doing in the there's so, always misunderstandings and <laughs> confusion and then they wind it together they definitely have a very specific like formula but it works <laughs> yeah so in that uh in 1933 flying down to rio that was a, a very unusual thing really the director on it seems so unlikely that was marion c cooper who directed King Kong. And he loved exotic uh, locations and adventure. That was his thing. And uh, he didn't want to do this movie. And, uh, but they told him, listen, you know, we're going to do aerial acts. It's gonna be, there's gonna be aviation in it and it's gonna take place in Rio de Janeiro. So it is exotic. And uh, so there was, um, was it Dolores Del Rio and uh, Jean Raymond were the leading act, the leading parts, and and honestly, yeah, the supporting players of Fred and Ginger totally stole the show. And uh, uh, and they do. Um, there's a, there's a uh, there's two musical numbers where they perform, and one and the first one is Music Makes Me. And Fred is playing, he's fake playing the accordion in the band. And Ginger has one of the most scanty, sexy dresses imaginable. And, uh, and wow, it's such a great song. Music makes me. And then the dance number was the karaoke. <laughs> so yeah, I have, I, I, and uh, Fred sings Music Makes Me. There's a really wonderful recording of him doing it. Um, and when he recorded a song, there would often be a tapping chorus. He was like a, it was like a percussion solo. So you could listen to the record and there was Fred tapping and you could just imagine. <laughs> and as Fred and Ginger appeared together on screen, Ginger actually designed a lot of her own costumes as well. The famous feather dress when the feathers are kind of floating off the dress the famous beaded dress with the giant bugle beaded sleeves that are bell-shaped that kept slapping Fred in the face every time. I mean, those are iconic dresses though. They're very, very memorable and are even still inspiring fashion today as, as Kimberly Truler has pointed out many times. Yeah, may, may I share some images? Cause I have some. Oh yes, I would love that. Okay, it's a good, great segue. All right, so, uh, so just to share some images, here is a nice, close up of Ginger Rogers of the pages with her, her whole uh, array of recipes, other things that we are not trying. So this is the page about the tasty midnight snack for the after theater party that we just made. 
But we can try these in the future, though, Jenna. I am game if you are. <laughs> well, I'm in with Ginger now. I, I trust her. I, I thought this late supper salad sounded kind of yummy to, to yeah. round out this after theater. But, but there, and there is Ginger herself with, with her refrigerator. What more could you want? Maybe around Thanksgiving, it'd be fun to try the cranberry mash stick ring because I kind of like the idea of trying alternative recipes from stars that could be a Thanksgiving or Christmas or yeah. kind of dish. All right. It's, uh, that one has gelatin in it. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that can make stuff <laughs> difficult, but we'll try it. And here's a little thing I just did. Oh, this was from when I tried out the recipe at the first. So you can see the results up close. <gasps> All right. So. And so this is from 42nd Street. And you know who this is, Carrie Bible. These adorable ladies. Una Merkel. Am I saying her name right? Una or Una? Una Merkel. Yeah. Una, Una Merkel, Ruby Keeler, and our own Ginger Rogers with the monocle. So in 42nd Street, they were all chorus girls. Uh, and very wry. And uh, well, Ruby Keeler played a little bit more of a naive, a naive, camera, sparky character. And um, also, uh, that movie featured Bibi Daniels, who had been, you know, she was a, a, like a mid to late career at that point. This was a talking picture, 33, and Bibi Daniels had been uh, doing silence with Harold Lloyd. And uh, she still looked fabulous. And she was, uh, she played kind of the, the diva uh, in the show. Um, and uh, these girls were all the up and comers. They were knocking themselves out. And uh, here's Ginger Rogers and such a wonderful. I love that outfit. Classic 1930s outfits. Oh, so good. And uh, this is from Gold Diggers of 33. So this was the same year. Aileen McMahon on the left, who is just a wonderful character actress who is who goes on to work with them in, in so many um, more of their films, the Fred and Ginger movies. But this uh, Gold Diggers of 1933 did not have, this was before she got together with Fred Astaire as a dancing partner. And Joan Blondell and Ruby Keeler. And this, of course, is from Gold Diggers of 33 when she does her We're in the Money. And that's a pre code costume. Woo! And not only Ginger looks good in it, there's a whole bevy of girls wearing this a similar out scanty, scanty coin covered outfits. And this is a still from uh, uh, the, the karaoke scene. And, um, flying down to Rio. So first of many fabulous sets. All the supporting dancers, fabulous costumes. This was supposed to be Brazilian outfits. You can see a precursor of, um, oh, oh gosh, what's her name? With the, with the uh, flower basket, flower on her head. Carmen Miranda. Carmen Miranda. We did a Carmen Miranda episode recently. Oh, you did? Yeah, we made yeah. a sweet cream avocado, which was a surprisingly really good. And where was she from? She was from uh, South America. But then mm -hmm. um, she had a Portuguese background, and we did a whole episode about her heritage and her career, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Wow, I'm just noticing here. Do you see the setup? How many pianists they have? Two, three four, five, six, possibly six pianos fitted together that the Fred and Ginger are on top of. That's the that. artistry of these films is what really impresses me from the costumes, the set, the lighting, the dancing. I mean, this was like classic Hollywood at its absolute peak of creativity. Exactly. Now, a lot of the earliest, earliest sound films they, they felt a pressure to, you know, they thought that musicals like Ziegfeld Follies was such a popular type of uh, entertainment. And now that we had sound and film, you know, we don't need to have to tell epic stories. We should probably do these musical things. And they did many of them. And some of them, 
you know, the, the sound equipment was still, uh, you know, not quite up to par yet. And so the sound on those things, and also they would often do very elaborate set design, but, but somehow they didn't have the glistening glory of these later things. And of course the Busby Berkeley and Hermes Pan, these choreographers just were, had, had visions uh, beyond those early musicals. Because, because the thing is the Ziegfeld was a stage musical. So the choreography was to see people at a great distance from, the, from you know, your theater seat. And then Busby Berkeley to the maximum, you know, utilize the fact that you are in a studio, you can shoot cameras from above, from any angle. And uh, they just, just were so experimental and um, ah, just fabulous. So this is, the, uh, this is her scanty uh, dress that she wears for the Music Makes Me number. Well, she doesn't uh, dance in that one much, but uh, this, this is um, still from um, do, 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 uh, Gay Divorcee, the following year, 1934. So this is already, they're on their way uh, to being a real team. And, and, and they went on and on working with the greatest uh, musical composers. So flying down to Rio, 1933, this was Vincent Newman's wrote the songs with Gus Edwards, Edward Elescu, fabulous Tim Pan Alley, top of the line songwriters, and Max Steiner uh, was the musical director and did the score. And um, RKO, um, uh, Max Steiner was a regular uh, uh, music wise on these, except I noticed that every one of these that follow through the 30s incorporates a different composer personality. So, so for instance, um, this was the Gay Divorcee, and so that one was Cole Porter music. And apparently uh, it came from a theater show that Cole Porter had written called Gay Divorce, but the, the Hayes Code made them change the title because gay divorce almost sounded like, oh, what fun divorce. And to say gay divorcee meant that, you know, it's like Merry Widow. It's like you could get divorced, you'd be happy, okay. We'll go with that. So of course, so Cole Porter did the music on that. It had the very famous scene, Night and Day. And uh, so this is from Top Hat and that fabulous feather dress that Ginger designed herself, by the way. And I heard in, a, in an interview that everyone always wonders what color was that dress? I guess I always thought it was probably white. <laughs> but she said in an interview that no, it was ice blue. Oh, wow. And, uh, and when you watch the movie, you can keep in mind that, okay, so this was her design, Fred was, very against it, partly because the feathers were sticking to his tuxedo and, and flying off in his face like feather dust. <laughs> and he was very annoyed by this dress and he, he thought to have her change to another dress. And she said, no, I am wearing this dress or I'm not gonna do this. I hear that was one of the few big arguments they had actually was over that dress. It sounds like it. And I guess, you know, there were dresses that you know, she had to make these things work and that was no easy feat because they were, she was always doing these numbers in full length gowns that you could easily catch your shoe and her trip on it. They're kind of, it's kind of amazing that it's a whole extra aspect of dancing that you're not, you know, you're not wearing something that's necessarily comfortable or easy to move around in. But she was right about the dress though because when you see that movie, of course, it looks gorgeous on the magical and as he said it was molting you know i mean the, but the feathers did fly off and you can see that on the screen and it becomes just like heaven you know it just looks like you couldn't plan that it just happened in the way the feathers move and so he had fought it but it was a good fight because it's 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 an all-time magical uh scene and dance and so that was top hat and this time this was irving berlin did the music for top hat and so 
I think that one was, uh, it was heaven and the music was cheek to cheek, which says heaven, I'm in heaven. Oh, oh so good. <laughs> yes. My heart beats so that I can barely speak. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. So they also had that number, um, it's a lovely day to, to be caught in the rain. To be caught in the rain. And uh, he does his quintessential top hat, white tie, and tails. So, and so just like yeah, yeah, I have a question. Is top hat the movie where they did the roller skate dance? I remember the, the, the you know, I don't remember. I know uh, they did the roller skate dance. I just can't remember which one of their movies that was in. Yeah, they said that was her idea, too, that roller skate. You know what? I don't remember. Somebody will have to fill us in on that. I know that this this one was the the getting caught in the rain. She was in riding outfit, in a horseback riding outfit, and um, they were in an outdoor kind of covered gazebo, like this. It was almost like a Maxwell Parish set. It was so so gorgeous. So this is um, there were a couple of interesting uh, images from the set from that scene. Just just wow, gorgeous art direction. So lovely. And uh, so this is from Swing Time, which was 1936. So Top Hat was 1935. They had already done uh, music with humans, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin. Um, Swing Time, this was Jerome Kern and Dorothy Fields did the music. And this was with a new director. They had had uh, director Mark Sandridge on these other films. And uh, Ginger in an interview, I think that she ended up having a little bit of a romantic uh, Thing with George Stevens, but he was, um, he really wanted to make sure that the studio was treating them well because he, he, he really got their value. And, and if she put up fights over this or that, it's like, please listen to them. And Fred also had a lot of uh, ideas about how dance could be, should be filmed um, to get the best, uh, you know, to get to get the, what he wanted out of the choreography. And, um, and so George Stevens was really somebody who was listening to them and really helped them develop um, storytelling through the dance. So it wasn't just a dance number with maybe the lyrics of a song telling the story, but the actual dance movements were part of the storytelling. Um, so just, just, just a magical thing to watch. Really. And that dress also looks so beautiful in motion. Isn't it that? Oh, one of the best ever. <laughs> one of the best. It's a big dancing flower, you know? Yeah. Just the way those things were constructed and the way they moved. She really had a great sense about that. Now this one, a Swing Time, uh, they had some of the famous songs were Pick Yourself Up, Dust Yourself Off, Start All Over Again. And uh, the, the the lovely number, The Way You Look Tonight, and which is absolutely not a glamour. It was so sweet. It really uh, just utilized the song and the scene in such a nice way because it was so down home. You know, he's actually like outside in her apartment and she's washing her hair, you know? So, so she kind of comes out and she's like, you know, coming out of the bathtub, you know, with a little soap in her hair. And then he sings the way you look tonight. <laughs> so, so that's what dear sweetie could sing to you when you're just not in your gown and you're all your finery, which you, what you thought was your finest moment. <laughs> Here's another uh, still from Swing Time. Super delightful scene. See, I think I have just a couple more. This was uh, this is uh, Ginger and Hermes Pan working on the set for Swing Time. We just um, it was a wonderful documentary with a box uh, came with a box set of, of Fred and Ginger movies, and there was an interview. Uh, There's a documentary about them there, and a wonderful interview with Hermes Pan uh, later in life. And he really looks like the spinning image of Fred. You'd think that they were brothers. Um, and and uh, some other people said that their, their stature was so much the same 
they were on creative wavelength, exactly the same. It could have been separated at birth. So here's Ginger Rogers with George Gershwin. And um, this was uh, still from Shall We Dance, or it was just backstage when they were working at Shall We Dance. That was 1937, and George and Ivory Gershwin did music for that. Um, some of the classic scenes where they can't take that away from me. And, you know, that song, They All Laughed at Christopher Columbus. <laughs> but ha, 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 who's got the last laugh, man? Yeah. <laughs> great. You know that phrase, they don't make them like that anymore, certainly applies. <sighs> well, you know, one of my, I always, I always find myself saying in conversation when people are always talking about all these special effects movies and things that have dystopian subjects and uh, lots of explosions and things like that. Uh, always, and people say, but this is what people want. They want that. And I always say, but they wanted Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. They just, they, everybody's forgot. I mean, nobody knows. They don't know what they want because it's so not around anymore. And of course, you know, when they did do, yeah, you know, periodically people are so inspired by these films and, and Steve Martin has, has tried to do things sort of in that vein. I know uh, there's a Peter Bogdanovich interview and there was one of his movies Something like maybe they all laugh. That might have been the name. Yeah. I've never seen it, but he said himself that it was in the in this vein. And uh, I think uh, La La Land was obviously inspired by a lot of classic um, movie musicals too. Yes, I mean they're just. Uh, we should just make sure to make sure we've seen every single one. The problem with so many modern movies, though, is they edit so much that you really can't get a sense of the whole dance performance like you could in the front of Sgt. Gerard's movies. So it's just so differently constructed today. I did see The Artist recently. Mm -hmm. I forget what year that came out, but- maybe... oh, 2012. Ah, oh, okay. And there's a, they did a, they knocked themselves out with the final dance number in that movie. And it, that was just swell. <laughs> you know, I that movie. It was such a heartfelt tribute to the silent era and the pioneers who made them, and I really enjoyed it. Exactly. Exactly. And um, uh, and then made a very nice use of very minimal sound, like actual like dialogue that worked really well. Um. Uh. So let's see. Uh, I, oh, this is uh, also from um, from Shall We Dance? This is they said. It, Promenade scene. Deck. And uh, maybe this might be the last one. Um, and this is with Irving Berlin, of course. And uh, this is from 1938 on the set of Carefree. Oh, maybe Carefree is the one with the roller skate number. I'll have to check, but that maybe that's the one. That might be. You know what? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that I've seen that one. I have to, I have to go back and check. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, for letting me. I love it. And, uh, <laughs> oh, well, back in the kitchen. Back in the kitchen. <laughs> but I think Ginger was overall just such an independent woman. She never liked to be thought of as simply a woman under the, the thumb of Fred Astaire or like it was a Spengali trolley thing. Like she really wanted to emphasize she was independent and her own woman. And I think winning the Oscar for Kitty Foyle really kind of established that she could carry a dramatic film. She could do other kinds of films and that she had very much a big name on her own. And she really was a remarkable woman. Um, there's so many interviews on YouTube. She interviewed with like Joan Rivers and so many different people because she lived a long time. And she truly was a really fascinating person and certainly a very talented one. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me to do this because it's, it's really been a, a joy to uh, just concentrate on ginger and just just uh, follow her recipe like all the other ladies would have done in the 30s and um, and just to spend time with with her her films and and, uh, and reviewing some of those interviews just just really delightful you know it's like some people the more 
the more you look and learn, the more you enjoy them and the more you, you have um, extra you know, respect. <laughs> I agree 100%. And I'd love to do more episodes with you. So definitely let's let's do many more in the future. There is so much more to talk about. There's so much more food to make. Yes. Oh, and you were going to show that you, you're the serving plate. The serving yeah. plate. Yes. My friend Darren Barnes and his husband, Eric, they were in the Norma Shearer oatmeal stick episode I shot last summer. They collect all sorts of uh, vintage things and well, it's got crumbs on it because I ate the sandwiches, but <laughs> this is a plate from the 1930s from the Ambassador Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, which of course was home to the Coconut Grove nightclub, which is one of the most famous nightclubs at the time in Hollywood. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll post it on the blog as well, Ooh, but close up of the plate. Um, there's even two cool. lions and an ambassador logo up at the top <laughs> here. It's really cool. Okay. So I thought, what better way to eat Ginger Rogers sandwiches than off an ambassador? <laughs> oh, I have something that I could share too that and it's handy. Wait. Uh, a lady friend of mine uh, gave me this little shot glass, very beautiful, um, with a very beautiful etched key on it. This is from Perino's, and apparently uh, her uncle was a wine steward at, uh, at another glamorous Hollywood a restaurant and you know sometimes you can just look at these artifacts and go oh this was a nice place <laughs> i mean just the weight of it oh it's just oh too good you think <laughs> things could talk <laughs> so this is a, these are the tantalizing pieces of evidence you know i mean sometimes people say oh you know why are you so interested in this i'm sure those times were not any better than they are now. And I'm sure they were full of scandal and they were full of all kinds of complicated problems. I mean, it's not that we're, we're glamorizing it to a fantasy world, but, but just, you know, these artifacts tell you just how, you know, you have the, we have the evidence, we have great films, we have the buildings we can look at and experience and, and, you know, toddle our way into, and and these beautifully made objects just tell you, you know, this this was this was a special time in American culture. I have a friend in San Francisco, and there's been a few nights during the pandemic where we'll make dinner in our respective kitchens over <laughs> Zoom together. <laughs> we'll sit at the dinner table and eat together over Zoom, and then we'll go in the other room yeah. watch a movie together over Zoom. And... Exactly, and it's um and yeah, exactly. You could be with people out of state, out of the country, just as easily as people in your own town. So I've got friends that watch Hollywood Kitchen in the Netherlands, in Germany, in England. So I've kind of made friends with a lot of new people during the pandemic. And I kind of love that food and film. And there's certain things that can just bring us together, no matter where we live, what language you speak, what culture, what location, these things join us and that's really beautiful you know? yes Yippee! <laughs> <laughs> on that note should we sign off we should sign off so thank you so much janet this has been a delightful episode of hollywood kitchen more soon we are definitely doing more of these there's, yes, so, we there's are. So, so much good stuff to to talk about and investigate and more fun recipes and yes things. so Experience. until next time we will see you soon once again in hollywood kitchen in me you see a sinner and dancing is my crime Seems a sin I gotta give in to syncopated time It makes me lose my dignity, it makes me lose my voice Some folks call it music, but my folks call it noise I like music, old or new But music makes me do the things I never should do I like music, sweet or blue But music makes me do the things I never should do Self-control was something to brag about Now it's a gang about time Things I do I never forgive them for Just when I'm living them down 
Music makes me 